Hi, welcome to another Fundamentals Friday video. This is a follow on to a previous video I did on Kirchhoff's uh, current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law. So click here if you haven't seen that because that was a build up video to what we're gonna do in today's video, which is have a look at some basic DC circuit theorems, uh, specifically nodal analysis, mesh analysis, and superposition uh, theorem as well. And we're gonna actually apply Kirchhoff's voltage law and Kirchhoff's current law, which we learned in the previous video, to analyze a real basic circuit like this. It doesn't get much simpler than this, but you'll find there's actually a little bit of math involved, a little bit of cleverness in how you actually solve this. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna solve this basic circuit in three different ways, nodal analysis, mesh analysis, and superposition theorem, and hopefully come up with the same answer for all three. Three different methods to analyze it. First one we're gonna take a look at is nodal analysis. Now, nodal analysis uses uh, KCL, Kirchhoff's current law, uh, that we looked at in the previous video to actually solve this value. And what we wanna solve is the current through this resistor here. So what we've got is a basic circuit with three resistors and two voltage sources here. This is one of your like your more classic textbook uh, circuits they give you when you're learning nodal and mesh analysis and uh, Kirchhoff's current laws and things like that and solving them. And it's a little bit tricky. It's actually not obvious at first glance. Um, by all means, go away right now if you don't know about Kirchhoff's current laws and try and solve this and see what you get without using a circuit simulator. Yes, we can just whack this into a circuit simulator and calculate the current down R2 here, easy peasy, right? Done in a couple of minutes. But really, we're trying to learn fundamental electronics here. It's a fundamental theory, nodal analysis and mesh analysis that enables really deeper, rich mathematical treatment and calculation of lots, ton of stuff in electronics. But we're gonna look at a basic circuit today so that you can understand how these techniques work. In this case, nodal analysis. Oh, fun. Right, so what we've got, two different voltages, just to mix it up a little bit. This one's 10 volts, uh, positive up the top. This one's one volt, I've labeled them E1 and E2. So there's two voltage sources and three resistors like this. We wanna determine the current through R2. We've got three different value resistors here. I've just chosen them different values because we can. And uh, basically we've got a node here, hence the name nodal analysis and this is important to understand we've got one node in this circuit i've labeled it a and you'll see why in a minute now we could actually use this same nodal analysis technique to analyze any number of nodes in a circuit but today we're going to simplify it to one because there's already going to be enough involved in actually solving just one node here and you might think but dave we've got two nodes there's this other one down here well no because what we've got is when doing nodal analysis, we need a reference point. So we're gonna call it ground like this. We're just gonna put the ground symbol. We're gonna say this is our reference point. So we don't have to worry about this node. We really wanna solve this node up here because what we want is like the voltage at node A relative to our reference point here. This point is exactly the same. So there's no point analyzing that node. So basically only got one node in this circuit that's of particular interest to us and we wanna solve for. Now, of course, in nodal analysis, we can actually choose any reference point we want. It's pretty much arbitrary, but hey, we're just gonna pick this. It makes it easy and familiar to you. Now, this node is a junction, is it not? We learned in the previous video, Kirchhoff's current law that uh, the current entering to a junction must equal to the current leaving the junction. Or in other words, the algebraic sum of the currents at a particular junction is equal to zero. And we're gonna use that formula we learned last time to analyze all the equation that we uh, learned last time to analyze this thing. Now, by convention, although you don't have to do this, by convention, we are going to assume that all currents are leaving the node like this. There's no current flowing in. And yeah, that's not possible in practice, okay? But, but trust me, it'll work out in the end because technically we don't know without you know analyzing the circuit, we don't know which way the currents are flowing. Depends on the voltages that they could be flowing in, out, we don't know. So we're choosing an arbitrary reference point. And as I said, by convention, 
nodal analysis, just have all currents leaving the node like this. So we'll draw direction arrows. Now we'll start off by deriving the equations for each current, which I've labeled I1, I2, and I3 here. So we're fairly consistent, R1 equals I1, etc. So, you know, it just keeps it nice and tidy. So we start by deriving our equation, okay? So I1, well, what's I1 equal to? Let's go back to Ohm's law. We know I1 is flowing through R1. So how do you calculate the current through a resistor? voltage and the resistance, right? So we can go VA, because the current is flowing, A is more positive, we're talking about conventional current flow, A is more positive than this point over here. So we go VA minus this voltage here, which is actually E1. We could have called it like node B if we're doing, you know, a multi-node um, analysis and things like that. But in this case, it's E1. So VA minus E1, that is the voltage difference across the resistor, the voltage drop across the resistor there. And divided by V on R, I equals V on R, Ohm's law, R1. Too easy. And we can just plug in the numbers that we know. R1 is 10 ohms, E1 is, in this case, one volt, and we drop the units here. It just makes it easy, trust me. And so our, our now, our equation is VA minus one divided by 10. That is the equation for I1. Beauty. Two more to go. So let's do I2. What is it? Well, it's pretty easy. Remember, it's always referenced back to this reference point. VA, the voltage at point A. What's the uh, differential voltage just like we got here instead of V1? Look, it's ground. It's connected directly. So VA, it's minus nothing. So it's just VA on R. Too easy. Ohm's law. And I forgot that's actually R2 there. And we plug in the number that we know. We know R2. We still don't know what VA is. We have no idea. It'll come out in the wash. And so it's VA on 20. And I3, well, pause the video and try and do it yourself. It's easy peasy. Look, it's going to be, once again, VA, our point. Look, our current is flowing out. So VA is the more positive side according to the current that we've chosen arbitrarily. So VA minus... Well, the voltage on this side to get the differential voltage across the resistor. In this case, it's not E1 like before, it's E2. So it's minus E2. It's exactly the same uh, formula that we got before over R3. Too easy. And then we can just plug in the numbers that we know. We've got uh, VA minus E2 is 10 volts, drop the units, over R3, 30 ohms. Bingo. We now have the equations for all three of our currents. Beautiful. Now we apply Kirchhoff's current law. Remember Kirchhoff's current law? The algebraic sum of the currents at a junction equals to zero. There's our currents, I1, I2, I3 equals zero. Bingo, we just write it down. I1 plus, because it's the algebraic sum, well it's the sum, plus I2 plus I3 equals zero. That is our Kirchhoff's current law equation for this node. So that's called our nodal equation and we know all these values, well we know the equations for I1, I2 and I3 so we just plug them in. There we go, VA minus 1 on 10, that's I1 and then I plus I2 plus I3 equals zero. Now all we've got to do is solve the nodal equation and our value, VA, our voltage at that node will pop out. And that's the idea, whole idea of nodal analysis. We can calculate the voltage at a particular node. Even though I think I said right back at the start, we want to actually calculate the current I2 down here. Well, nodal analysis is actually calculating voltages. But once we get VA here, bingo, it's just relative to Earth, <laughs> Ohm's law, VA on R2, That'll give us our current. So this looks a little bit tricky, and if you're not good at algebra, then, well, you might just whack it into a calculator or Wolfram Alpha or something like that, and just, you know, VA will just pop out. But, hey, we'll do it simply. We'll just, like, expand this out. So VA minus 1 on 10 can be written as VA on 10 minus 1 on 10. So you just expand that term out, and then VA on 20 still remains VA on 20, and do the same expansion here, VA on 30 minus 10 on 30. So just expand that out, equal to zero. That just makes it a bit easier to reduce it down and get the value of VA. At least that's how I do it. 
And then we can just further uh, rearrange this and expand it out so that we just look in, so there's no divisions in there. We're just looking at uh, additions and multiplications here. Um, this is just the way I happen to do it. So VA on 10 is 0.1 times VA, you just bring the 10 up, uh, minus 1 on 10, 0.1 plus, so VA on 20 now becomes 0.05, so 1 on 20th times VA, so 0.05 VA, you typically don't show the multiplication sign in there, you just go 0.05 VA, as typically some people put the little dot in there, eh, whichever way you want to do it, I'm just going to leave it like that, and then uh, this term here can become 0.333 uh, VA minus 10 on 30 is 0.333 equals zero once again. It's looking pretty easy now. So what we do now, this is all basic math. You're you know, probably familiar with if you've done any sort of uh, you know, high school uh, type math, you should know all this. Then we can uh, gather our like terms. So we can actually just ignore the brackets. You can take those out. Um, our minus 0.33 comes over the other side of the equal sign, becomes plus 0.333. The minus 0.1 comes over and becomes plus 0.1 over here. And then we can uh, actually group these terms together for V8. 0.1 VA, 0.05 VA, and 0.333 VA becomes 0.1 plus 0.05 plus 0.0333 times VA. So now we've only got the single VA equals that. We can now easily solve for VA. So it's simple, we just add all these up, that becomes uh, 0.1833, take it to the other side, divide it, this is 0.444, just do that, VA equals 0.4333 divided by 0.1833, it equals 2.3636 repeater, actually, uh, volts. Bingo! Ta-da! We've just solved, we've just done nodal analysis to solve for node A using Kirchhoff's current law. Beauty! So, as we originally asked, what is the current through R2 here? What is I2? Well, Ohm's law, because we've already done our nodal analysis, beauty! We know what VA is, a VA um, I2, Ohm's law, equals VA on R2. 0.23, uh, 0.3636 repeater on 20, 0.1181, oh, 0.11818 repeater, actually. Amps, that's it. Beauty. So hopefully that wasn't too hard and you followed through and it looks like... It's easy, Kirchhoff's current law, and we just did some, but derived some basic uh, equations for the various currents, used our Kirchhoff's current law equals to zero. You see how I promised it would be uh, powerful to analyze this sort of circuit, and we went through and just plugged in the numbers we derived, and we got our answer. We worked out what VA here is, and we can, from that, we can work out anything else, and as I said, we can do that for any number of nodes. You would just repeat this process for all the different nodes, and then you'd end up with actually some quite complex equations where you're going to have to do some uh, matrices, you know, determinants and things like that to actually get your final answer. It's a bit more messy, but there you go. That's the sort of working. You can see it's not that hard once you actually sit through and go and do it. But yeah, it does look ugly. I've got to admit, it's easier just to type it into Wolfram Alpha or use your formula solver and your calculator, but hey, we're learning. So you're now an expert at nodal analysis. Let's go on to mesh analysis and use exactly the same circuit and see if we can get the value of current through R2. Uh, again, like we got before, we want, remember, we're looking for the answer point 1.11818 repeater. That's the answer we want to get. Let's see if we can repeat it using mesh analysis. I'm pretty confident in the basic laws of engineering. And I was just testing you because I got something wrong. This, I had 0.333 here, it should be 0.033, and yeah, there you go. Fixed. Yeah. I was just testing you. And if you're wondering, well, what use is this in the real world? Well, you know that circuit simulator you take for granted and it just produces magical results, how it can analyze your circuit with hundreds of nodes in it and do it, does it at each time step? How does it know what the voltages and currents are? I'll give you one guess. 
Now, next up we have yet another DC circuit theorem. This one's called mesh analysis. And just like nodal analysis before, this one uses Kirchhoff's laws, but instead of using Kirchhoff's current law like we used last time, you'll notice I've changed it to KVL, Kirchhoff's voltage law. That's what's used in mesh analysis. Now, the difference here is that nodal analysis is what you would typically use to uh, calculate a voltage at a particular node or junction within a circuit. But if you want to calculate a current, like as what our original question was, then mesh analysis might be a better technique to use because we're going to uh, look at calculating the current through I2 this time, and that's what mesh analysis is good at, calculating currents in a circuit. We don't care about nodes. In fact, I haven't even labeled this node node A. It doesn't actually matter. And we don't need any circuit reference points like we did last time because we're not calculating any reference voltages like this. We're looking at loop currents. So what is a mesh? What is mesh analysis all about? It's a little bit confusing, but stick with me. A mesh is an individual loop within a circuit. So for example, E1, R1, and R2 here, if we have a current which goes around like this, that is a mesh. And likewise, I'll draw it in a different color. You'll see why in a minute we can have another loop all around here like this. This is also a mesh. Now, we've also got another loop around the outside here, but that is not a mesh. And this is pretty critical. You can't have a mesh with inside a mesh. So a mesh is just sort of like the smallest loop possible within a circuit. So this one has, this circuit has two meshes and we'll uh, actually solve these individually and then bingo, out will pop our answer uh, for the current through R2 at the end. And yes, mesh analysis is more fun than a barrel of monkeys. <laughs> oh, let's go. First of all, we need to label these currents here. So I'm going to label this I1, and I'm going to label this one I2. And just like we did in nodal analysis, analysis we're going to get uh, some equations for these two currents and then solve them. Exactly, you know, basically the same technique as what we did in nodal, except we're solving currents now instead of solving uh, node voltages. Now, mesh analysis is sometimes known as loop analysis or loop equation analysis or something like that. And you can see why, because it's to do with solving current loops through a circuit. Now, what is Kirchhoff's voltage law? If you remember from the previous video, it's the algebraic sum of the voltages around a closed loop must equal to zero. Bingo! What can, you're probably guessing what our equation is going to look like. Now, just like nodal analysis, our current directions that we've drawn in here are arbitrary. They can be any direction as long as you're consistent. But by convention, when you're doing mesh analysis like this, you should use uh, clockwise current flow like this. That's why I've drawn them in going clockwise. And this is conventional current flow. You always do conventional, not electron current flow. But as I said, you can actually do it in the opposite direction. You can use electron current flow if you want, and it'll, you know, all the numbers will come out in the wash, but this is the convention. Now, this is the magic part about mesh analysis. We've assumed that the current is going in a clockwise direction like this. Now, it could actually be flowing in the other direction. The current through R1 might not be flowing that way. It could be flowing that way. It, and R2, likewise, look, you'll see that I1 is actually flowing down R2, whereas I2 is flowing up R2. This can't happen. You can't have a current flowing down and up, right? It's impossible. And yes, that's true. But this is just for the purposes of mathematical analysis. And this is the magic part you'll see in the end, how that if we've assumed the wrong direction for the current flow, it'll come out as a negative answer at the end. And that actually tells us something, gives us information about our circuit. Wait and see, it's magic. So we're going to choose this starting point down here. We're going to derive our equation for the various voltages and voltage voltages generated and the voltage drops in this particular loop I1 here, okay? And as I said, it must equal zero. That's Kirchhoff's voltage law, okay? So we'll start out with E1 here. So E1, we'll start out with this point, okay? E1, it's positive up here. So it's going, the current flow is going from negative up to positive. So that means it is a positive voltage. It's generating a voltage in the circuit, okay? So we don't go E1, it's positive. You don't have to put the positive in there. It's just not negative, okay? So it's actually generating a voltage. And then we have a look R1 here. 
what have we got? It's a voltage drop. So we're actually gonna have a positive voltage here and a negative voltage here. As opposed to this one, we went from negative to positive. So it's, a, it's generating a voltage, so it's positive. This one is going from positive to negative because resistors drop voltage, okay? We know because it's a resistor. You know how resistors work. They don't generate voltage. They actually drop voltage when you pass current through. So it's a voltage drop. So it's actually minus. And what is the voltage drop on here? Easy. It's R1, you got it, times I1, Ohm's law. Voltage equals I times R or R times I. I'm going to put it in R first, but it doesn't matter. You'll see why in a minute. And then, well, we've got another one. It flows down through R2 here. This is going to be positive. This is going to be negative here. So we've got another voltage drop. So it's minus R2 in this case. And the current is I1. So that's our voltage drop. And we're back to our point here. But we're not finished yet. Look, I2 is also flowing through here. So we have to take I2 into account. And what is I? I2 is going from a negative to a positive, right? So in this case, it's negative to a positive. It's like it's generating a voltage because it's going in the opposite direction to I1 here. Now here's the tricky bit and you'll have to stick with me with, with this. You can see that I2 is flowing in this direction. So just like I1 flowed in this direction and we have a positive here and a negative here. The same thing's going to happen here and I'm going to draw it in blue because it's caused by I2 here. So we're going to have across R2 positive and negative like that. And you'll notice that it's actually the opposite polarity. But we're writing our term for I1 here. So what effect does I2, because it's interacting on I1, what effect does it have relative to the direction of I1. Well, if I1, you remember, it's going from negative to positive in this case because it's been influenced by I2, I1 relative. So just picture I1 coming around here, going on this side here, it's going from a negative to a positive. What does that mean? Just like here, it's going from a negative to a positive it's a positive voltage, it's generating a voltage in a circuit. Even though it's a resistor, the effect of I2 flowing in this direction, which, which, which we've chosen arbitrarily, remember, flowing in this direction is causing a voltage to be up induced into the circuit. So it's a positive voltage, just like as if it was actually a little battery, a little power supply, and they're generating that voltage. So it's going to be positive R2, again, times, not I1, it's I2, like that. Bingo, and that is our equation equals to zero like that. And you can see how the color coding really helps you identify which terms are relative and caused by which particular currents. So we've actually got four terms in our equation there, even though you might think with, at first glance, I1 is only being influenced by three particular parts in the circuit. You're forgetting that I2 is having an influence as well. And if we had, if this was a bigger circuit and we had another mesh up here like this and a current circulating around here, we'd have a fifth term on here doing the same thing. We'd have to take into account I3 up here and it'd be uh, I1 times I3 and that'd be another positive term in here because the current would be flowing in a clockwise direction from negative to positive like this. Now let's do the equation from I2. Once again we have to uh, start a choose a starting point and I could choose down here but I'm actually going to choose up here and go down and do the voltage first just so our terms are like in the same order here. It doesn't matter it you know it makes no difference it's just I want it to be a bit neater. So I'm going to start with this point up here. So our current is flowing in a clockwise direction. So this is our starting point. Our current is actually flowing from, look, the battery is positive to negative. It's different to what we had over here. It was flowing from negative to positive. So it was actually producing voltage in the circuit. Now it's flowing from positive to negative, just like it was here. So this battery is effectively working like a voltage drop based on the arbitrary current direction that we chose. So you guessed it, it's negative. E2, just like it's a drop. <laughs> Brilliant. 
So you've got to be so careful doing these things, you can easily miss that and go, oh, it's a voltage. It generates voltage in a circuit. But no, it can be a drop. Depends on the current direction. And once you do this a few times, you'll get to, you know, you'll get to know and love this technique. And trust me, it'll all come out in the end. It's brilliant. So what's our next term? Our next term, okay, we've done this point here, our current, now we're looking at R2. So it's flowing from positive to negative, it's a drop. Okay, so it's negative R2, I2, okay? So that's our voltage across there, and then it goes through R3 like this. So once again, it's positive, negative like that, it's a drop because it's just a resistor. So we've got drop, 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 everything's dropping. God, where are the voltages being generated? Wait for it. Okay, so we've got uh, R3 this time times I2. But, aha, uh -huh, just like before, we have a fourth term, which I'll draw in red, because I1 now interacts with I2 over here. Now, we've got to look at the direction that it does that. Once again, this is flowing around like this. It's positive, negative, so it was a drop before in the previous equation, where is it R2? It was a drop, it was negative. But now you can see that relative to I2, assume, look, just imagine this blue arrow going around on this side now, it's going from negative to positive. Aha, uh -huh. it's a voltage generated. Brilliant, so that's a plus. So I1 is actually generating a voltage into the I2 loop equation here. Fantastic, I love this. Oh, so we're looking, um, so what does it do? R2 plus R2 times I1, because it's I1 doing the interacting, and then, ta-da, equals to zero. We have our two loop equations. Now, all we have to do is solve them. So just like before in the uh, nodal analysis, we've got some knowns in this circuit. We know what the resistor values are. We know what the voltage values are. So we can plug those into our equation here. I've moved the one we just derived down here because I need some space to actually do this. So uh, what we're looking at, E1. E1 is one volt. Okay, it's positive one volt. And then minus R1 is 10. We don't know what I1 is yet. It's gonna come out in the wash. So 10 I1 minus R2, which is 20 ohms times I1. Still don't know what I1 is. And then we can go plus R2, which is 20 again. And we don't know what I2 is yet. Once again, it will come out in the wash. So bingo, we can now reduce that and solve it. And just like before, we can leave it like that and just shove it into our equation solver. How solve it, whatever method you prefer. But we can actually reduce that a bit further. We can just uh, group like terms yet again. One minus, uh, in this case, uh, we've got two I1 terms here. So we can just um, 10 minus 20 like that. So we can go minus 30 I1. And then we can just go plus 20 I2 and that equals zero. And likewise with this one down here, we can go minus E2 which is 10, minus R2 which is 20, I2 minus R3 which is 30 ohms. Once again we take out the units, I2 and then we go plus R2 which is 20 and then I1 which we don't know yet and Bingo, equals to zero. So I've reduced that one as well, just gathered the uh, like terms 20 and 30 there. And bingo, we now have our two equations which we need to solve. Now let's take a look at these. You can see that they contain two unknown terms, I1 and I2, I2 and I1 there. And yeah, that's a bit tricky. You know, usually you might solve that with by determinants with a matrix. Uh, for example, you might, as I said, plug it into your uh, the formula solver on your calculator, which does the same thing. You can actually expand it out and do some things and try and solve it manually. And I probably don't have the space to do here. So let's solve this the modern way, shall we? We'll go to the internet. We'll use Wolfram Alpha to actually uh, plug these equations in and we'll get the answers for I1 and I2, our two unknown terms. I know a lot of people say that's cheating, but this is not a math video. I'm not gonna show you how to solve for two unknowns in these equations. Eh, you know, do it however, you know, whatever floats your boat. Let's go to the internet. 
Okay, so here we go. We're going to cheat like any modern student does, and we're going to go to Wolfram Alpha. But you could do this formula solver on your calculator, or you can do it in your head, or you can do it with pencil and paper, however you want to do it, whatever method you want to do to solve for two unknowns. So we can actually enter the equation here. I've entered the first one in here, and then we can actually enter the second one by going... Uh, comma like that and then typing in our second equation and it'll automatically know that uh, we've got terms in there now I can't label them I1 and I2 because I think it thinks they're complex numbers or something like that so I1 is going to be A and I2 is going to be B so you'll notice that we've got uh, two unknowns in there so let's just press enter magic happens magic happens wait for it Ta-da! We've got our answers as actual uh, fractions because it tries to uh, give you an, an exact form. But you can actually go to approximate form here and bingo, there's our two answers. A, which is I1, equals negative 0.13636 amps. And B, which is I2, is approximately equal to uh, negative 0.25455 amps. Let's go back to the whiteboard. So Bob's your uncle. We've solved our two unknowns, I1 and I2. So we know everything in this circuit now. We know the voltages, we know the resistances, and we know the currents flowing through each component. Well, we kind of do, and this is the magic I was telling you about before. You remember how we started out uh, going clockwise? We assumed that the current was looping around clockwise, but we got an answer both of them, I1 is negative. Our answer popped out of our equation as negative, and so did I2. What does that mean? It means that we chose the wrong direction. Both of these currents are actually flowing anti-clockwise, like that. So what does that mean for R2 here, for example? So I1, for example, is flowing, we assumed it was flowing down R2 like that, but we got a negative result. So I1 is actually flowing up like that through R2, and I2 here, that's also a negative. We assumed it was flowing up, but it's actually flowing down because it's negative. So it's flowing down R2 like that. Now we can actually work out the current through R2, D2. So what do we do now to actually calculate the current through R2? Well, we've got to subtract one current from the other because they're flowing in opposite directions. They're still flowing in opposite directions because they're both negative. So one is actually, our I1's actually going up there, I2's going down there. So we've got to subtract them to cancel them out. Now here's where we can actually drop the sign. And we know that the larger value, point, uh, 0.25455 amps is flowing down, so our that's larger value, absolute, than the other one, so our final current is going to be flowing down. So we just subtract the smaller value, 0.13636, from 2.5455, and we get, what do we get? 0 0.11819, it should actually be 18 repeater. It's exactly the same as what we got last time. Winner, winner, chicken dinner, high five, woohoo! So, phew, Kirchhoff's current law, Kirchhoff's voltage law, they hold. We got the same answer using two different techniques, nodal analysis and mesh analysis, got exactly the same answer for the current through R2. Fan-freaking-tastic. That was easy, wasn't it? Piece of cake, no worries. But now, there's actually a third method we can use to calculate through R2. It doesn't use uh, Kirchhoff's voltage or current laws, but I thought I'd show you anyway. Let's see if we can get the exact same answer yet again. And I can't really leave this one out because although it doesn't really have anything to do with Kirchhoff's voltage law and Kirchhoff's current law, it is one of the basic DC circuit solving theorems. And it's called the superposition theorem, the superposition technique, whatever you want to call it. And it's a bit of a mouthful, but this is what it basically states. The current in any element is the sum of currents produced by each source acting independently whilst the other sources are replaced by their internal resistances. It might be easier if I just show you. Please excuse the crudity of the model. Didn't have time to build it to scale or to paint it. Now, what it basically means, if we want to solve the current through R2 down here, we can do that 
by the sum of the currents produced by each source acting independently. So what we do is we can just, if we start with E1, we take out E2 and we replace it by its internal resistance, which is a short circuit. And you should know that from your basic circuit theory, a power supply in ideal power supply is zero internal resistance. An ideal current source is open, infinite uh, internal resistance. So we replace it by that, and now you should be able to do this. Anyone can do this, right? This is, you can now calculate the current through here. But, aha, uh -huh, we then have to, it's the sum, remember? So now we have to replace this one with a short circuit, put this one back in here, and then we calculate the current through there, and then we sum them is the sum of the currents produced by each source acting independently. So you can see how this is much easier. We won't end up with any weird equations uh, and generate any weird equations like we had to with nodal and mesh analysis. It's basically just Ohm's law and current divider stuff. Very simple. So let's go through the exact same example we had last time and see if we come out with the same answer. You think we will? I'm pretty confident once again, engineering for the win. So all the way over here, I've got the original circuit that we wanted to solve, our two voltages with our three resistors, exactly the same as before. I've redrawn it here because we need to solve this twice because we've got two sources. And by the way, the superposition theorem, of course, only applies if you've got more than one source. You've got to have multiple sources and they've got to be linear as well. So let's solve for E1. So what do we have to do? We have to replace E2, we have to replace, in this case, the other source we have, but if we had more than uh, one source, we would have to replace, uh, if we had more than two sources, we'd have to replace all the others with their internal resistances. And as I said, a power supply, a voltage, a battery, or whatever it is, uh, it has a zero internal resistance. So we replace it with a short circuit. If it was a current source, in our circuit, we would actually replace that with an open. It'd just be open circuit. So I've got to replace all the other sources. And now it just becomes a simple question. But what I've labeled here is I've got our IT, which is total, the total amount of current coming from this source, and then IR2 down here. So now we want to derive an equation for uh, the total current first. So now what we've got to do is derive an equation for our total current here, and that's easy. It's just Ohm's law. Look, I T equals, what does uh, current equal? Voltage divided by resistance. So in this case, E1, okay, is on top, divided by our resistance, which is going to be the total resistance of our circuit, which is R1 in series with R2 and R3 in parallel. Easy, R1 plus R2 in parallel with R3. Three. There we go. And if you haven't seen those two lines before, that's just a common way to uh, express parallel. And of course, you can solve your parallel resistors any way you like. If you're lucky, you might have a calculator that has a parallel key. As far as I know, there's only two calculators on the market that has it, the Casio FX61F and my own uh, microcalc. So if you haven't got one of those, you could do it the old fashioned way. I choose to do it R2 times R3 over R2 plus R3. You can do the one over version if you like. So there you go, I've just expanded that equation. Uh, parallel, I've plugged in the numbers that we have. So we have all of our resistor values. We have our voltage E1, which I forgot to write up there before. Bingo, our answer is 0 0.04545. Repeater, actually, I like that. That gives us a bit of confidence because we know that our solution is a repeater. So, you know, that gives me the warm fuzzies. Now, we know our total current flowing here. How do we calculate our current flowing down R2? Well, uh, along with Ohm's law, some of the basic stuff you should learn is the voltage divider equation and also the current divider equation. Very similar to the voltage divider equation. In this case, I1 is equal to IT, and then you use your current divider because some goes down here, some goes down there. In this case, it's the opposite resistor. We want R3 like that over R2 plus R3. That is our current divider. Easy. And it's simple. We just plug in our knowns because everything is known. None of this unknown solving equations for unknown rubbish that we did before. And we pop out with an answer of 0.02727 repeater. Once again, another repeater. Brilliant.
So then we do exactly the same thing for E2. We replace E1 with its internal resistance, which is a short circuit, and we solve for IR2 yet again. It's exactly the same way. I won't bore you with all the details. Exactly the same uh, equation we generate I. We calculate IT first, the total current coming from the battery, and then we use our current divider equation to once again calculate IR2. I had that labeled I1 before. <laughs> that was oopsie, uh, mental uh, brain fart from the previous one, um, and we'll call it IR2A, and this is IR2B. And bingo, it comes out to an answer of 0 0.09, uh, point, yeah, point 0.09090. Once again, a repeater. Brilliant. Feeling pretty confident. So we've got our two different currents here for uh, two IR2s. So we now have to get the algebraic sum. Once again, we have to take signs into account. In this case, it just so happens that they're both positive, fl well, flowing down like that. So there's no negative or whatever, but it could have been depending on uh, the circuit that you're actually analyzing. So we take those two values, whack those into the equation, just the algebraic sum, to get our final value down IR2, which is what we're trying to get here. So it's 0.02727 plus 0.09090. What do we get? Ta-da! Magic. Exactly the same as before, and the time before that. Winner. So there you have it. Sorry about the length of this, but I wanted to go through step by step in detail. I hope you enjoyed these uh, series of two videos here. Uh, one showing what Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff voltage law is about, and then actually applying it and applying three different uh, to circuit DC circuit analysis techniques, nodal analysis, mesh analysis, and superposition uh, theorem here to solve exactly the same circuit, we get the same answer three different ways. And you think, well, what's the difference? Which one should you use? Well, you could probably saw uh, here, uh, you know, the superposition in this particular instance was the easiest, uh, probably the easiest one to do because we didn't have to, you know, uh, get some weird algebra with, you know, unknowns and stuff like that. It was just basic Ohm's law and current divider. So that happened to be the easiest case uh, here, but that's not always the case. Um, nodal analysis, as you saw, you would use if you want to calculate a voltage in a circuit. And as I said, that's a popular technique used in uh, SPICE uh, circuit simulators and things like that. They use various versions of nodal analysis and they also do some mesh, but it's it's easier to do nodal analysis. Mesh analysis, uh, easier if you have a lot of uh, sources and you want to calculate currents and things like that. So yeah, choose whichever one is appropriate for your particular circuit. But there you go, that's really interesting. So this is really basic fundamental stuff, so fundamental, it should be taught directly after uh, Ohm's law, and typically is you learn Ohm's law, then you learn what, uh, you know, voltage dividers, current dividers, what a voltage source is, what a current source is, and then you learn Kirchhoff's current law, Kirchhoff's voltage law, and then you learn your basic DC circuit theorems for solving circuits, and as I said, you know, like these are often academic you know, examples and things like that. And sometimes you don't, you could probably spend your whole career and never have to do nodal or mesh analysis or something like that. But hey, it is a fundamental technique, which is so important. Just the mathematics of it goes into actually solving a whole bunch of other stuff. As I said, circuit simulators, all that sort of stuff wouldn't work without stuff like this. So math for the win. Even if you don't like math, it's pretty easy. It wasn't that hard at all. So there you go, you're now an expert. Kirchhoff's laws and nodal uh, mesh and circuit position theorem. Go have a play. If you like that, please give it a big thumb, thumbs up. And if you want the t-shirt, I'll link that in down below as well. And if you want to discuss it, uh, YouTube comments, blog comments, all that sort of stuff, support me on Patreon. Thank you to all my uh, Patreon supporters. The link for that is down below as well. Follow me on Twitter, all that sort of stuff, you know. Rate, uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel, like, rate. No, they don't rate anymore on YouTube, do they? No. Anyway, catch you next time.